little bit of an introduction. I'm Ken Rutsky. Uh, you can see my name and Twitter handle up there. Uh, and uh, I'm here to talk about the new chapter of marketing. And uh, we've got a great panel here. I think that's going to, and there's the last member. I told you you had time. I missed one sentence. Uh, so how many people in the room have marketing in their title? Or have marketing responsibility, I should say. Okay, so almost everyone. Of those who don't, do you have sales responsibility or business development responsibility or exact responsibility? Okay, great. So uh, the genesis of this panel, uh, you know, is an observation that you know because the world's changed so much, marketing has to change uh, in accordance with that. And, and we're going to talk about a lot of trends like social and mobile and data and just the, the ubiquity of information. But it's really hit home for me. Uh, the other day. And, and before I tell that story, anyone remember Calvin and Hobbes? So there's a great Calvin and Hobbes where Calvin is a cartoon, a uh, comic strip. They don't have comic strips anymore, really, do they? The Daily Dilbert's about it now, I guess. Uh, so anyways, Calvin's in the backseat of the car, and they're driving on the freeway, and they come to the sign that says, bridge weight limit, three tons. Calvin says to his dad, hey, dad, how do they know the weight limit on the bridge? And in the front seat, the dad says, well, what they do is they drive a truck over it, and then they drive a heavier truck over it, and then they drive the heavier truck over it until it collapses. And then they, know, then they rebuild the bridge. And you know, you have the classic great example of the mother saying, honey, if you don't know the answer, just tell them. <laughs> so, you know, it used to be, we said, go ask dad, right? Go ask dad. If you didn't know something in the house, it was go ask dad. I have, I, now this really hit my home. It, it's home for me. I have four young kids, all under 13. God knows how I got here this morning. Uh, but. When they have a question, it's no longer go ask dad, it's go ask Google. And the same thing has happened in B2B and, B, and even in B2B marketplaces. It's not go ask Gartner anymore, it's go ask Google, it's go ask the internet, it's go find the information because we've moved from an era where information was a commodity, a, a very tightly controlled commodity to one where it's totally commoditized and not unavailable. And that has dramatic implications and impacts on sales and marketing as I think the panelists are going to talk about. A uh, corporate executive board that looked at B2B marketing put out a st statistic about six months ago that said 57% of the average B2B sales cycle is done before the first vendor contacts. And if you think about what that means, it's staggering. It means that a buyer is at short list before your sales rep even talks to them. So it used to be, you know, marketing kind of ended at find a qualified buyer. Now it's like find a buyer ready to buy. And so I think that's really the fundamental challenge of, of what we're calling the new chapter of marketing. And so I'd like to kick it off and you know just go through the panel, maybe starting uh, well with Brian since you're next. Sure. Maybe, yeah. Is how do you how do you break through all that information overload and get to those yeah. buyers you know before, during, and after the yeah. sales cycle? Yeah, that's uh, an interesting um, statistic. You know that, and it's true, right? You just think about your own personal life, and and you're you're you make your you, you become aware of the options in the market, you become aware of what you need uh, when, you're, when you're making a purchase well before you engage with a vendor. So that statistic is, is interesting, but certainly not surprising given how we all operate. I think, you know, to me what it means, I think it has a lot of implications on marketing. The two that come to mind are that you need to, to live in the, in the worlds where, uh, you know, those, those consumers are living, right? Where the people you're selling to are living. So that may mean, you know, certainly mobile. It means that you're living, you know, in and you're coming up in searches. It means that you are, um, you know, in the right communities and forums. So, you know, I'd say one, you got to be where the, where your your consumers are living. And secondly, um, I think you need to be um, you need to be consumable. You know, very readily consumable, which means that the information that you're providing has to be sort of bite-sized, right? It needs to be delivered in chunks. It needs to be, you know, um, very uh, sort of, you know, synthesized um, and, 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 and consumable, right? So, you know, you know, Twitter obviously drives a lot of that. Um, you know, the way you uh, interact in, on YouTube needs to be very short, right? It needs to be short and, and exactly to the point. So two, two reactions, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, anyone else want to jump in on that one? Yeah, I'll, I'll just add I to that. I want you to introduce yourself. I'm sorry, I'm being a very terrible host. Names are out there, but let's put You want us to enter, go around yeah. really quickly, or what? No, but, uh, okay. when you talk first, yeah. when you do that, go ahead. Okay, I'm Doug Wick. Thanks. I'm from Digby, um, Director of Product Marketing and Product Management. Um, 
I would I would say I would I agree with you. I think you have to think like a buyer and be engaged where you know those buyers are are completing that 60 to 70 percent of that sales cycle. So analyst analyst relations is really big. So having a lot of good analyst relationships, making sure you're in the reports that you need to be in. Um, thought leadership is really important. So not just you know not just marketing what your product or service is, but how should someone see the world that your product or service lives in? Because if they see the world the way you do, guess what? They're going to end up wanting to buy your product or service because it's shaped for that world, especially in, in an innovation or kind of evolving marketplace. Um, so, so those are a couple other things that I'd add to that. Yeah. I think too. Justin or Eric? I think uh, you know, there's a be a couple key things. Uh, Eric Monder, I'm the Vice President of Business Development at Urban Airship, and we are in the marketplace around um, mobility and around uh, you know, allowing brands to connect to their always connected customers, wherever they kind of live, work, or play. And I think one of the key elements for brands in connecting with customers, you brought this up, um, Ken, is around the difference between interrupting somebody and inviting somebody inside the conversation. And um, that, that is a big shift from kind of this broadcast media about mobile ads and around interrupting somebody, whether it's on a large screen TV, around the web, uh, or you know, even mobile advertising on, on, the, uh, on a phone, that inviting somebody to a conversation is critical and key. And I think one of the elements and shifts that we see is that on average, uh, people are spending about two to three hours a day inside mobile applications on mobile phones. And when a marketer thinks about that, and we'll actually eclipse TV watching time this year. When a marketer or a brand thinks about that, think, how do I actually connect to that customer when on that device? And I think everyone knows that, but perhaps doesn't realize how much time people are spending inside mobile apps. And I think being able to connect to somebody within a mobile app on their phone, wherever they are, is kind of a key shift uh, in terms of, uh, from a market perspective, be able to connect them and, and deliver a message that's relevant to them. Justin, you live in a little bit of a different world <clears throat> in the mobile world, although I guess mobile phones intersect with it. Yeah. But maybe you could add the perspective from sure. Tolaris and tell us a little bit about that. My name is uh, Justin Chuck. I'm the Director of Marketing and Business Development for Tolaris. But uh, a lot of the things that we've seen in our industry, which is mainly telecom, is there's been a significant shift in terms of the attention span of the customers. A lot of them are ignoring traditional marketing, and like we, like we mentioned before, they're going and doing their own research. And what we found is the most critical in building new business opportunities is the relationships, the people you know. Um, and for the first time in human history, there's been the, the world's relationships have been mapped out through LinkedIn. It's the first time that the relationships between you and everyone else is now mapped out on a global level. And so being able to leverage those relationships and the people you know and the common denominators between you and somebody else is a key differentiator. Instead of putting your ad out in front of a bunch of strangers, now you're trying to work with people who you have a, con a connection with. And that's really the shift that we've seen in our industry is trying to focus on the people we actually know one way or another. That's great. I want to ask a follow-up on that, but uh, I want to make sure we come back to this inviting in and living in the customer's world, because I think there's an interesting trend there. Yeah. But quickly, as a follow-up to that, how do you do something like that? I mean, it's easy for me to do it. I run a very small business. I can look at LinkedIn. How do you do that at scale with a marketing and sales organization, leverage those connections? Any thoughts from Justin on you, because he brought it up, and then I'll let the other panelists chime in on that? Um, you know, as long as it's, it's a culture shift, you just have to, make, have to make sure that everyone in your organization is part of LinkedIn, that they know how to utilize it, that they're the most important piece of LinkedIn is actually putting your network into it. If you don't tell LinkedIn who you know, it can't build your network and map out your relationships across the globe. Most of us would say we probably know 100, 200 people on an individual basis. But if you put that information into LinkedIn, whether it's your neighbors, your friends, your past colleagues, um, LinkedIn will map it out on the second and third degree levels and your network would go from 200 to usually around 15 million instantaneously. And so that's the, the main key is to get into LinkedIn and tell them who you know so that they can map it out. So let me broaden that question a little bit. Yeah, go ahead. I just, to me, that um, the logic about LinkedIn seems more nuanced than that um, in several ways. So, for example, I personally have uh, just about 4,000 LinkedIn contacts. 
contact, and I consider them my personal contacts, right? These are people that I know that are either everything from good friends to maybe one of you after this event. Um, that said, uh, I have an employer, and the employer would love to leverage those LinkedIn contacts, but it's a little bit like, uh, you know, me, you know, accosting my mom and trying to sell her, you know, whatever, Mary Kay Cosmetics, you know, reaching into her purse to do that because, you know, you don't want to jeopardize a relationship that you've had for years um, and a relationship base that has taken years to develop for the simple expedient of jamming, you know, some message down. So um, unless there's something that I believe will benefit my network, yeah. right, that it's something really of interest to them, that, you know, mostly is non-commercial, right? It's stuff like, here's an interesting article, yeah. uh, I'm not gonna do that. So to what extent is that the theme of kind of leveraging LinkedIn actually meaningful? And let me, let me expand on that a little bit to generalize it to social media in general yes. in a B2B context. Uh, are there any tips or techniques or things that you guys have found successful in reaching new buyers or managing uh, the relationship with existing customers? So, uh, yeah, I think, it's a ahead, great, I think it's a great comment. I think, you know, there's a lot of learning that's going to be had about this over, over the next few years. I think you're right, it is more nuanced. Um, what, some of the things we do is we, you know, you, you know I think it's important, you, you said something that resonated, which is that as an individual, th this is your network on LinkedIn or Facebook. So you need to determine how you want to interact with that network. Um, you know, and very often it is in providing things that are meaningful to people in your network or you know, tips or tricks that you think your network or part of your network will benefit from. So that's one of the things that we do. So for example, we will push out suggested topics to people in our company that we think they might want to share with their network. Ultimately, it's their call. But position them and provide them content in, in a way where it might be viewed as valuable to the people that would be, we'd be asking to put on their network, right? I think that's one way to do it. So make it meaningful right. content, ultimately, you know, I'm never going to say to someone, you need to push this out to your network, or, or certainly not on Facebook. Yeah, it's funny. Um, Go ahead. Well, the other idea I was going to say is there, there's communities out there mm -hmm. that I think are largely untapped, um, and we're still exploring this, but there's communities of groups where we're finding we can engage in a community conversation um, in LinkedIn, for example, and, and not make it about Zora, right, but make it about questions. You know, have you thought of this? And get a dialogue going. And again, it goes back to your first question. That is not about necessarily promoting Zora per se, but engaging in the dialogue in the way that those, the, the people in that community want to engage. Right? So there are two things. It, 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 and it's very, it's yeah. very nuanced. If you yeah. if you push it too far, yeah. you, all of a sudden you you lose credibility. Right, because so. you do. You, I mean, you, when you are coming in as a company, you do have a commercial agenda. So trying to pretend you're not is just that you don't is disingenuous. On the other hand, you don't want to push that agenda so, so much. Yeah, so it's yeah a that's right. Yeah, I, I, the obvious. Uh, you know, we do a lot of, um, in terms of like building social network and, and using those, uh, those tools to kind of build a, a base of customers. It's all about, for us, you know, at Urban Airship, um, education. I mean, this is a new market growing, and so people are hungry for use cases, best practices, uh, successes and failures. Be open and honest. It's a very, like, like I said, you know, people are researching and doing 70% of their research before they pick up a phone or, you know, enter something on the website. So, you know, they have the ability to quickly shut you off, just like they quickly have the ability of turning off or deleting an application, you know, in our business. People download lots of apps and they turn off a lot as well. So how do you actually deliver some value? Um, and for us, it's around it. purely education, just trying to drive that at a high level, uh, more so than what we do. So, any okay. thoughts on social media? Um, yeah, I, I, I would. Um, so, so Digby's also in mob the mobility space, um, but we're really focused on on large companies. So, as kind your of, customer, as our customer. So, um, we're we're a very sales driven organization as a result. Um, but the role that marketing plays in that, I, I will, I'll take a little bit of a different spin on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is actually a tremendous resource for drawing the org map of a large company and in ways that you could never do before. In fact, 
they might be researching you, you can also research them and, and you could do 60 to 70% of your research on how they're organized and who's in charge of what and who said what in the press and who tweets and who's put things out there that give you some hints about what their priorities are. Um, there's, there's a ton you can learn and, and so our, our inside sales folks and our marketing people will work closely together to figure out kind of who's who in the zoo and then um, they might put together an event strategy. So we're gonna go to these following events because these events score highly in terms of the attendees being the types of people that we're trying to reach and we have these 10 people we wanna to talk to at this event, these five people. You can, you can get really specific. Which five in this room? Oh, I'm, I'm not sure. Marketing didn't, you know, didn't give me a brief. But, uh, well, no, um, <laughs> I, I can't share that in my secret dossier. I want to come back to uh, a couple of things I've noticed in the conversation as we go. I want to come back to technology in a little bit because uh, Gardner said that the CMO, has anyone seen this? The CMO will spend more on technology by 2014 than the CIO. So I want to come back to the role of technology in a little bit because I think that's really interesting. But before that, let's go back to this inviting in and living in the customer's world. I spent, I blog a lot about this. I call it viewpoint. And I gotta give kudos where kudos is due. Zora is one of the poster childs, I think, who's done this with the subscription economy initiative that they've run, where, you know, I don't know, 80% of your marketing seems to be about the subscription economy and not about Zora, and I think it's been brilliant. And maybe you can talk about the, uh, you know, you can talk a little bit uh, Brian, about the evolution of that and, and the value you've seen from it and maybe some of the learnings you've had uh, yeah, from that subscription yeah. economy so, um, initiative. It, it, it is true. We spent a lot of time talking about that and, and related themes, I think. Um, for us, it was and, ha and remains really about this transformation. I mean, you know, we provide a technology that, you know, as, as I think I mentioned, you know, provides a platform to run subscriptions. But really, you know, the market for us, the subscription businesses, the market for us is, is, is the thing that's so exciting about the market is this transformation from this very different world of how, just and take the vertical of software, you know, how software used to be, on-premise, one-time, you know, unit-based, transaction-based, you know, um, type of, you know, SKU-based pricing models to this recurring relationship model. And so we've, we felt that it was very, very important for us, and it was in our interest to talk a lot about this transformation going on in the market and provide uh, best practices. Initially, to your question about how this has evolved, initially it was just talking about the trend. You know, do you guys realize there's a trend going on beneath, you know, uh, you know perhaps, and you're not aware of it, you know, that you didn't subscribe to music and, and, and movies a few years ago, you didn't subscribe to car services, you didn't subscribe to games, and now you do. Did you realize that in your companies you didn't subscribe to these things and now you do. So initially it was very basic. And now it's become much more about, uh, you know, to, to your comment, I think it's much more about um, thought leadership. It's much more about, um, you know, advice and best practices. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you grow a subscription business? Yeah. How do you think about, you know, 12 dis different pricing and packaging strategies, right? Uh, how do you manage retention? How do you manage churn? Um, how do you, uh, increase the dollar value per customer. So it's moved from just sort of talking about a trend and a theme, which was thought leadership in itself, to much more about playing a sort of an advisor consulting role. And how does that how does that work within your marketing mix? And you know, is that you look at that as top of the funnel, yeah. middle of the funnel, or yeah, how yeah, do you yeah, think yeah. of it? In, in, in well, actually, uh, you, we think of it all the way through. Frankly, I mean, certainly at the top of the funnel, it is you know, it's getting into those conversations about well, what are the big movements going on in the market that we want to participate in and respond to in the press and the media and social. But it certainly plays its way all the way through. We look at, for example, events uh, today or uh, webinars which are really targeted at uh, opportunities that are further down the sales cycle. And we really focus those, again, not on Zora, right? Because they can learn about Zora through any other means, but really on you know what are the more meaningful sort of questions those customers are asking as they get close to making a purchase decision, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, there, you right? know, um, again, I think some of the things we do in terms of, um, you know, kind of thought leadership and education, I brought some, you know, marketing materials here, uh, obviously print, uh, believe it or not, but also <laughs> on the web, but it's all around um, kind of quick and clever kind of education, like who we are, what we do, kind of customer examples. We have this uh, thing we call the little black book of results, you know, it's like use cases and case studies, 
We have another one called uh, the Good, we created this Good Push Guide because it's around a channel and communication that's new for marketers. And, you know, as an industry as a whole, just like when email started, you know, 20 years ago, it's like we want to avoid spamming or uh, letting marketers know best practices around when to deliver push, what's the right time, you know, just like any marketing message or email or, or, or text or social, you know, conversations. So we created this kind of good push guide in, in general. So things around, you know, what to do, when to do, uh, alerts and notifications and those types of things. And we've seen, I think the other piece around invitation, uh -huh. um, what our customers are doing is letting customers be in control of their experience. So I'll give you an example. Uh, ESPN Mobile is the customer. You know, you can have a preference panel um, which says I'm interested in the 49ers, I'm interested in scores at the end of quarter versus something else. And you give the power of, you know, of the preference to what they're interested in to the consumer. Um, those types of kind of preference centers or giving them control rather than, like any marketing message, rather than just sending a broadcast message to everybody that would be relevant to some but most would ignore that. Okay. So, Any, anything you guys have on invite and thought leadership and living in the customer's world? I think Doug, you said living in the customer's world, right? I, I, I think, um, I mean, every company, especially a new company, is built around a, a hypothesis that the market is moving in a certain direction. And so you want to get there and have a product for, so when it arrives, you're, you're ready to, to, to hit it at the right point. So in order to, you should talk about that movement. You know what? Why? Why did you build the product the way you did? Why are you? Why are you? Why did you decide to start this company? And and the subscription economy is a great. That's a great kind of. That's a great example of kind of being where the puck's going, um, and talking about the fact that it's going there because even talking about it can accelerate that toward you as well. So so uh, I think that's a. I think every innovative company should do that. Why don't we talk a little, uh, go ahead, Justin. I was just going to mention um, a lot of marketing comes down to entertainment. You know, rather than looking at a panel of people, you might not have the same attention span as you would if you were to go to a concert. And so as marketers, I think the number one goal is to entertain your audience through valuable information. And what we do is we have, we leverage LinkedIn with LinkedIn groups. And so we push a, a weekly newsletter with news and information about what's happened in the industry industry insights, kind of like a blog. And what's nice within the social media environment, lots of people are able to join. And, and we have around 100,000 subscribers so far. But it allows us to allow us, it's more of a snowball effect. Because if we were to have that type of news outlet outside of LinkedIn, we wouldn't have the snowball effect that we would inside of LinkedIn because of the, the tremendous group that's already there. And so I think entertaining your audience and indirectly marketing to them is key as of today. And 100,000 in your market is a huge number. I mean, you've got a, what I would call a micro brand, right? And I think when you're you know, not in a big play vertical, you know, a horizontal play, but you're in more of a vertical, having a micro, a micro brand is tremendous. And if, you know, is it another event? And uh, serial entrepreneur said, you have a micro brand when you have 100 customers because you probably, you probably touched 100,000 people in the process of getting 100 <laughs> customers. So that was, I, I thought this concept of microbrand, I'm gonna work on some blogs on, I thought was really interesting. Uh, why don't we shift a little bit to technology? Maybe you guys can talk about how technology, uh, you know, you guys probably aren't as old as me, but you don't look like spring chickens either. Uh, how technology is changing the way you market and you know, what are some of the key uh, learnings and tools, you know, from whether it's, you know, uh, how you're packaging and pricing things, how you're utilizing uh, technology like Marketo, mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, sales, sales and marketing automation. Where are your big investments around technology and how are they having impact? And how are you choosing which investments to make? Uh, maybe we start over on the other end this time. Uh, so I think in terms of, I mean, obviously we're, uh, uh, we're, we're, we're a customer of Zora, we use Salesforce, and we use marketing automation solutions, et cetera. I think kind of key investments for us uh, is rates to kind of optimizing our channel from a market spend um, is, it's not around that, technology or companies in and of itself uh, is, is, you know, we found, you know, we had those solutions, you know, some of those a year ago, people just weren't utilizing them. We weren't doing enough as a company to train and educate our own sales organization or marketing organization, you know, to do that. I think we've had 
you know, the, the shift in our company is around the discipline necessary. So I think, you know, key elements is around it was a change kind of top down that we must use these solutions or the salespeople will not get paid. You know, uh, you know these types of hard. That would be the stick. You know, that's the stick. Uh, you know, showing that um, through market spend and webinars and seminars and events that we put on, that we're quickly putting that information into the, you know into these tools and delivering real leads results for the sales organizations. So they're, so they're seeing kind of not this uh, market sales, but really you know, uh, joined at the hip solution about here's what market is, marketing is trying to do in terms of the top of the lead funnel, lead generation, and we're going to score and we, we, and we have weekly meetings during, you know, our sales meetings about how we're doing and accomplishing that on both ends. So lead scoring is part of that? Lead scoring, results, um, the actual return on investment from every event, we, we map that. We're very disciplined about that on a weekly or bi-weekly basis on an executive level to determine whether we should return to that event, seminar, activity. I like to say marketing, uh, in the CEO's perspective of marketing now, has gone from black art to black science. <laughs> CEOs used to think, what's that marketing guy? He's like doing the Marlboro Man commercial and talking to his agency and they guys don't wear ties. And now it's like, he's got a data science. It's a data guy, right. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Um, a lot of the technology that we use is uh, Google Alerts. Once we identify our target audience, we're able to track them in terms of new job offers, acquisitions, um, press releases, changes. And so we can track blog posts that they make, I interactions on LinkedIn. And so we, we try to find marketing moments is what we call it, where something has happened. And that's when we, you can swoop in and, and take the deal. And but the only way to actually have the time to see everything that's happening, you need to use someone like Google that has their hands in just about everything. And so you can use their eyes and ears to track your target audience. And it's really easy to find your target audience in LinkedIn if you have the right network, you have the right visibility into who you're looking for. And it's really the only search engine out there that can instantly build you the perfect prospect list. And with that, you can combine it with the power of Google Alerts and engage with your clients when it's the right moment and not just out of the blue. So you should know if you're in the Falco business, Justin's watching you. Yep. <laughs> um, I think from, from we're, we're still a relatively small company. Uh, we've got about 40, 50 people. Um, so we don't have a lot of technology investment. Um, I think one tool that hasn't been mentioned is, is Twitter. Um, it's, it's actually pretty useful. There's not a lot of people that tweet that are your target people that you're trying to sell to, but um, it's a good way to build kind of a little deck of thought leadership people that talk about things that are going on and go to a lot of events and tweet prolifically at those events so you kind of know what's going on. And, and, and so it's, it's a good, uh, it's, that can be a good resource if you build the right kind of list of followers uh, or list of people that you're following. Um, I would say the one thing, uh, just to be a little bit um, uh, contrarian to the technology investment technology thing, is to leave your when you're when you're small or when you're trying to really gain headway in the market. I would I think you benefit a lot from leaving your marketing a little bit flexible. Mm -hmm. um, if you have people, your goal is to put salespeople in the right conversations, then they should be trained to to not kind of repeat what marketing told them to repeat, but but to assess kind of how, what the worldview of that customer is and kind of spin the marketing to meet yeah. that worldview. Because um, we get all kinds of stuff, because uh, we have location-based analytics, location-based marketing in our, in our marketing. Um, if people ask us, um, you know, how do we, how does it feel to compete with Foursquare, or you know, <laughs> so you, a lot of different worldviews in in, in in evolving spaces, and you kind of have to be ready for how you compete with Foursquare, right. um, even though you don't really do that. Um, <laughs> so so uh, that flexibility is important. You probably have a little bit of a bigger team. Yeah, we have a bigger team, and actually, it's, it's, a, it's a great question, too, because I think, I mean, just generally, and I have a slightly different angle here, is there are so many great technologies out there to use in marketing. I mean, and they're relatively inexpensive, too, mm -hmm. and, and because they're SaaS-based. Yeah, there's you know, a guy, you Chief Architect. You ever <laughs> see this guy, Chief Architect? No. He's a blogger. He's got this chart, and he's like, 
all the marketing things a CMO can buy. Uh, but there must I, be 800 I, I probably things have the more, more than I should. Uh, <laughs> we actually go through a portfolio review of marketing tools. But the cool thing about it is, I, and I encourage my team to do this, is to try things out because a lot of these things you can try uh, and you know, and then decide if you're going to buy them. Yeah. So if you, you test them out, see if it's valuable or not. But I'm going to take a slightly different angle here on the tools because really it's the insight from the tools, right? That's the part that to me is more meaningful, right? So how do you use the data from the tools? And this is, you know, this is kind of the holy grail, you know. And we do it. Uh, we could probably be a lot better, but I see our customers doing some really interesting things, and I thought I'd just share a couple. So um, you know, again, we. You know, uh, we, we sell to customers that run recurring revenue subscription businesses. And in a subscription business, like many of you probably have, it's all about this ongoing customer relationship, right? And, and so what you really need to track is, you know, are you acquiring customers? Are you retaining customers? Are you adding dollar per customer, right? Those three things. And so we have customers using data from our system, but other systems to do really interesting things to, to basically grow their, their ARR. So for example, churn, right? They're using some analytics tools that sit on top of our platform to look at historical uh, buying patterns and, and retention rates and renewal rates to do predictive trending on when will they see churn. So we have a customer that will, you know, they said, okay, in the third renewal cycle, you'd see a drop in retention, and that changed their behavior. They were able to look at that, that pattern and then say, okay, in the third renewal cycle, let's do a different sales promotion, or maybe come out with a slightly lower price point or packaged offering for that customer, because we know there tends to be a trend where, where they drop off. Another example is pricing. You know, you can, you, can, you can test, the beautiful thing about SaaS and recurring businesses is you can test different pricing plans and say, you know, for this demographic, you know, let's give this price point at that offering, maybe do freemium here, you know, maybe we, we do an annual plan or a monthly plan. You can test all this pricing and packaging. And based on what you're learning and what you're seeing customers do with those plans, you can then optimize the packaging or tweak the pricing. We have customers in the media industry, uh, the Times, you know, the, the Times in, in London, if you go to subscribe, they are on, on a regular basis changing the price point. You may go to subscribe to the Times one day or one hour and get a very different response. You may be in a different uh, zip code or area code in the UK and go to subscribe and get a very different price point. And they're just using that to constantly determine what is the right you know, pricing and packaging plan. So we only have, yep. a, we only have about eight more minutes left, so I want to give uh, a little time, about five of those minutes for questions, and then let each person on the panel give a few wrap-up thoughts. So uh, questions? A uh, couple of questions, um, if there's time for some. One first, then we'll see if any <laughs> So um, the first one is on the uh, validity of mobile advertising. And what I mean by that is uh, I used to be at AT&T, and there was a fun study that was done mm -hmm. looking at how uh, eyeballs tracked, looking at screens back in the day of banner ads. And basically, it turned out that the eyeballs went everywhere on the screen except where the banner ad was. And these days, the thing about mobile ads that I've seen, I remember seeing them. I have no idea who the advertiser was, what they were selling, or why. So realistically, especially with the, you know, the momentarily momentariness, if that's a word, of the uh, of uh, the impression, as well as you know, just the fact that people are already in distracted surroundings generally, and they have some other mission. Is there anything? Is there any there there? I think there's, uh, you know, a couple of comments. I think there is, it's not gonna go away. I mean, it's a big business and a big industry, so it's not like uh, that's gonna go away anytime soon. But I think you've accurately addressed all the challenges. <laughs> it is the, you know, the most valuable real estate in the world is this device. And how does a brand get in the hand on a consumer's device and you know what was intrusive on the web is more intrusive on a very small device so um, I think there is um, challenges for that and I think um, uh, it, you know like anything it's got to be relevant uh, and specific to individuals and I think it's it's challenging where it's too broad and too and, and not relevant so people will turn that off uh, and, and ultimately turn off you know the application certainly on a mobile on a mobile device specifically so th this is all about Intrusion versus invitation, and you know what Urban Airship's about, and why you know we're powering seventy thousand mobile applications in a variety of industries: B two B and B two C, Walmart, Starbucks, Oracle, 
media companies. You mentioned you know, ABC, CBS, you know, ABC and others, USC Today, breaking news. In all industries and in all mix and you know, sizes, and I think that shift and that success is, is around people want to be invited into that conversation rather, rather than interrupted in that conversation. Want to add something there, uh, Doug? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it, I think it's reflective of kind of the the state of display ads on the web in general. Mobile just kind of is just stoking that fire of CPM kind of race to the bottom. Um, I, I think that, uh, and I think this is probably ties into what um, what Urban Airship's perspective is too. Is that you know if you market to your loyalists and and if you really make them have a great experience or loyal customers. The dynamic now is that they will they will market for you, um, and and that there's a lot of collaborative buying in the marketplace um, and a lot of word of mouth. So I think I think marketing is shifting a little bit more toward investing in loyalty to fuel word of mouth versus pure acquisition marketing, um, which advertising yeah. really is. We call, we call that the shift kind of from paid media to owned media, yeah. right? And and that shift is around that invitation to consumers. And it's and we're measuring and our customers are measuring metrics like app retention and app engagement and social sharing, which is the ability mm -hmm. to kind of building that community around that, as well as certainly commerce, you know, around the application. So we're seeing you know two to four hundred percent increase, you know, through the use of solutions like ours. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned earlier that for the Gartner research, yeah, uh, you know, CMOs are mm -hmm. going to spend more. First question is, do you agree? You know, uh, and secondly, where is I'm sorry, the question is whether Gartner and other analysts are relevant. All right. And no, I think no, we no, had no, a no, little no, bit no. of disagreement. No, I, think, I thought your question was IT spend by, by yeah, CMOs. Yeah, that's what the Gartner said. Yeah. You know, the IT yes. spend by CMOs. Oh, CMO. CMO. Yeah. I, Cloud. Yeah, I mean, I would refer, seriously, Cloud. Chief Marketech, it's not spelled right, but it's something like that, has a great graphic that yeah. shows all the categories of marketing investment that you can make, and it's overwhelming. And when you look at that, yeah, I don't know if Gartner's broke it out between marketing automation and push marketing and mobile marketing. I'm sure they did, but I don't, I don't even know the breakout of that at all. Or, no, I mean, I would just respond. I think the answer is yes. I mean, I spend more of my budget now than before. Yeah. In, in I got the sense it was the more expansive sense of CMO, not just marketing, but including uh, product management. Yeah, this chief marketing officer. It's, it's, yeah, it's expansive, but yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're seeing that as well. I mean, our buyers are CMOs, VP Marketing, VP Mobile, not the IT organization. Uh, any last question? Any, yeah. I just want to ask if you guys, is all the traditional media dead then for SaaS companies like print, radio, TV? Is everything inbound marketing now, or is the sales team doing any cold calling at all? Anything, hmm. anything traditional? We do. Anything? Well, you know, definitely we're doing cold calling, yeah. I think, but in terms of like, uh, I mean, we're on the small side of companies, but uh, growing fast, but not TV or radio, but um, we're doing a lot of print, um, actually, and I think there's value in kind of unique ways of, of doing that, kind of in the shape of phones and those yeah. types of things uh, for us. But uh, no, we're not um, on TV or radio, but definitely cold calling to, to these kind of moments that you talk about, which is trying to capture through blogs and through other medias, like what is specific? What did we see about a particular person or a company that we're tracking in an article? And then when we send an email on a cold call basis, something that's specific and relevant it, to them rather than just like a general broadcast. Yeah, I think I still think it works well if it's really targeted, if it's, really, yeah, if it's targeted well. So in the spirit of inviting rather than intruding, we're at our time limit, but I'm happy to let each panelist have a quick wrap up comment if uh, you guys would like that. Okay, so we'll start in the middle this time, Doug. Oh, okay. Um, well, I mean, I, I would I would just say that that um, you know marketing and, and obviously I've got a little bit of a unique situation relative to some of the others other other marketers here, uh, but but I, I would say that that um, I think that probably the takeaway from if you're a company like ours. Is is to you know sixty to seventy percent of the buying cycle is happening on is happening before they talk to you, so sixty percent sixty to seventy percent of your research you should be matching that with the research that you're doing. You should be preparing for those conversations when they do happen, so that when they, so that you already know them. They already know you, but you already know them as well. That should kind of be the goal, um, and and um, and when the in, in the in to kind of spark those conversations, and then you you're much closer to the end. Justin? 
Yeah, I would just emphasize that <clears throat> all of our sales teams come with their own unique relationships, and we shouldn't uh, ignore those relationships and try to market to, to less people, market more to less people, and not just everybody. I love the idea of marketable moments, Brian. Yeah, I would say this idea that um, in this new chapter of marketing, the theme, just the the fact that the customer is is uh, is a you have a recurring relationship with the customer, and focus on that relationship that begins before they purchase, you know, you know, and, and on. And it really is not just through that point of transaction, but it goes on much beyond that. Eric. Yeah, and I think kind of, you know, big theme for, you know, what I heard today uh, and some of the topics around go to where people are spending their time. And, you know, certainly for us, uh, um, you know, two or three hours a day on a mobile device, you know, how do you as a brand, as a marketer, connect to that individual? That's a key shift. That's a fundamental kind of key shift in the market today. Um, and if you're not connecting to them, you know, I think you'll perish. <laughs> so I think in summary, find a marketable moment, have a viewpoint, be in their world, and uh, invite them in. And I think uh, we could probably talk for two hours. I was worried we weren't going to have enough <laughs> material that I, I got through one third of my question list. And I want to thank the panel. I thought they did an awesome job. <laughs>